All right, so in this lesson, we're going to be talking about phrasing, blues phrasing in particular. So we have a, a blues composition that we're going to be playing here in a minute, which is a standalone minor key, very slow and simple. And I think you're really going to like it. But before I got into that, I just wanted to just mention to those of you that feel like you're overwhelmed by trying to learn how to play and feel like there's so many good players out there and every time you see it, it's frustrating. This is a good lesson for you because we're going to be focusing on the emotional side of it. This is not about being a technical player. It's really more of a headspace than anything. So I'm just going to be sharing some of the things that I've learned through the years uh, and little things that I've picked up on that can really help improve your phrasing. So by the end of this, I, I think you're going to walk away with a whole new set of ideas. And if you haven't seen any of my videos before, my name is Brian, and I have a website called ActiveMelody.com, and it's 10 years worth of in-depth lessons just like this one, which are all designed to help you become better at improvising, jamming on the guitar, writing your own music. That's really what they're all geared towards. And it's the good stuff, the roots kind of stuff, you know, old school country and, and rock and blues and that kind of thing. None of the cheesy, you know, kind of metal stuff. That's just really not my thing. Uh, and probably not yours if you're watching this. So if you're interested in that style of music, check out Active Melody. But in this video, we're going to break down the composition which I'm about to play. We're going to break it all down note for note. I'll share all of my phrasing ideas. And if you want to get the extra material like the tablature, which you can print out and, and access later, or access to the on-screen tab viewer, which is interactive, you can highlight sections and loop it and have all of that. You can get those things by going to activemelody.com go to the weekly lessons page and do a search for EP420. All right, so the first thing I want to say regarding phrasing is sometimes it's the things that you don't play which say the most. So phrasing is all about, uh, you know, making little statements and telling a story and bringing emotion into your playing. It's not about being the fastest gunslinger in the West. You know, there's a time and a place for that. But most of us, that's only a top, you know, the top 1% of guitar players that get to that level of being super technical. They have all the God-given talent, you know, that good ear, they've got the right tendons, their fingers are long enough and all of that. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the rest of us. And I'm not a very technical player myself. I know how to express myself with a guitar and I know what my limits are. And I do try and push them. I mean, you should always try and push yourself a little bit. But I've it's taken me years to become comfortable in, in that space. And so the, one of the first things I noticed, that when, and this is listening to Albert King, B.B. King is probably the best, actually. Uh, but if you listen to the pro players, Jimmy Vaughn, he's another one that I just love. But listen to the way that they phrase things. They'll make statements, you know, but it's not a run-on sentence. It's just a... It's simple, but as a listener, I can hear that and I can feel comfortable. It doesn't feel uh, make me anxious as a listener. It's actually a great story, and I want to hear more of that story. So you have to remember as a player when, we're, when you're learning to phrase things that you're telling a story. And so it takes the pressure off you. You don't have to try and, and impress somebody with, with you know, burning up and down a scale anymore. Now... You have to try and think about a different way of impressing someone, and that's to tell a really meaningful story. And sometimes just a single note. That kind of thing can, can really turn heads more than somebody that's going all over the place. And just remember, it's a good thing to stop and pause. A vocalist does that. They stop and they catch their breath before they go on to the next phrase. You should do the same thing. You're singing with your fingers when you're playing lead. And so when you're working on these phrases, you 
You hear that? It's nothing is technical there at all. I'm just minor pentatonic scale playing a few notes. We're going to go through all of this here in a minute, but I just wanted to start off by saying it's okay to, to pause. The other little point I wanted to make, and then I'm going to reiterate these points as we break this down, is it's okay to repeat yourself. Just remember that it's okay to repeat phrases, repeat licks, even as you're doing them. For example, little triplets like that. I mean, how many blues songs have you heard with that kind of thing in it, right? This kind of thing. I'll go back to it again. We'll repeat it again. A lot of, uh, I see a lot of beginner players that don't, they're not taking advantage of that. And it's because you're nervous. When you're, when you're just getting into it, you're, uh, especially if you have an audience and you know, people you haven't played for and you're maybe you're trying to impress somebody, you're trying to even impress yourself, I don't know. But you get nervous and when you get nervous, it's kind of like even when you're talking, you just tend to have a, you know, ramble on like I do sometimes. I get nervous when I put on these cameras. Uh, but, but that's what happens is we tend to ramble and we do that when we're playing. But you have to remember, stop, take a breath, repeat yourself. That's okay. It's okay to go back and repeat licks like that and phrases like that. All right, so let's break down this song. Now, this song is in A minor and there's three chords in it. There's an A minor, which is your one chord. Think of it as a minor one chord. The four chord is a D minor. It's a minor four chord. So minor one, minor four. And then the, the five chord is major and it's an E. It's an E7, in fact. So we have an A minor, a D minor, and an E7. And that's what we're playing over. Very basic structure. But the first thing I want to talk about is you need to know the three minor chord voicings. There's three main ones. Now, I realize when we get into triads, you can play them all over the place, but let's just simplify this. Let's not make it complicated. There's three main minor chord voicings that you, you definitely need to know. And this will totally change your, your playing if you, if you don't know these. This is going to be a major breakthrough. Um, but let's think about the chords down in first position. Those first chords we learned, G chord, C chord, D. If we think about the three minor chords you learn in first position, you learn an E minor, right? Then you learn an A minor. And then what's the other one? It's a D minor. So the reason I'm showing you those is everything that I'm gonna be playing, and actually every minor chord that you play up and down the neck is some version of those three chords, the E minor shape, the A minor shape, and the D minor shape. Now, the one thing with the D minor shape that makes it a little different than this, for example, where we have just three fingers here, is I use four fingers when I'm doing this. So I play a D minor shape with my pinky on the third fret second string instead like that so that I can put my ring finger on the third fret fourth string. And this note is just a repeat of this note. So you're just doubling it up. It just fattens up the chord. And by adding that ring finger, it just makes it easier to slide that chord around. All right, so those are the three minor chord shapes, the main ones. Now that means if I were to go from an E minor to an F minor, for example, I just slide everything up. I bar with, with my index finger where the nut was. So I'm obviously capoing with my finger. That's an F minor. There's a G minor and so forth. You can see how that works, right? Same is true with the A minor. You're just going to have to bar where the nut was. So that means we can play these, you know, these shapes, these three shapes down in first position anywhere on the neck. So why am I saying all this? Well, we're going to go back to this song now. So this song is in A minor. And so the first thing I want you to do just to get familiar with this, let's look at the three A minor chords that we can make using those three shapes we just talked about. Well, here's the first one, which is the bar on the fifth fret, and that's using the E minor shape. And then if I come up here, I'm playing an A minor using the D minor shape. And then if I come all the way up here to the 12th fret, and I were to bar and play, that's hard to do, so I'm just going to play the top three of that, the triad there. That's an A minor up here using the A minor shape. So hopefully you understand where those A minors are coming from. E minor shape, D minor shape, A minor shape. All right, so now that you have those three minor chord voicings, now we're gonna connect the minor pentatonic scale to those chord voicings. You know how you have the different patterns of your minor pentatonic scale? You can connect those patterns back to these voicings. So the E minor shape, we have pattern one. 
Hopefully you can see how this A minor chord here using that E minor shape fits into minor pentatonic scale pattern one. So what that means when we're playing these licks is I can be connecting them to chord shapes. So I can... I can go back and forth between a lick and the chord. It's all right there in the same neighborhood. Same is true up here. And when I come up to this, the D minor shape, you, but playing the A minor, I've got pattern two of the minor pentatonic. Right? And so really what that's doing is kind of, I mean, if you think of the chord shapes, that's just what an arpeggio is. The arpeggio is just the notes in the chord. So you're really connecting the arpeggio to the, the minor pentatonic scale, but it gives you a nice framework. Same up here, you've got your pattern four. Right? And then you've got your uh, A minor up here using the A minor shape. All right, so now we have all the background information out of the way. Let's break down this song. So I started this on the five chord, which is an E7. And I played it like that. Now this E7 chord here is just like playing a C chord. If we take our C chord, but slide it up so that your ring finger's on the seventh fret, but then put your pinky down on the seventh fret third string and play the middle strings. You're not playing the high uh, one string there, but that's what I played. Actually, I, I did hit the low six string, open E. So I started with that and then right into the A minor pentatonic scale. Now most of this is gonna be minor pentatonic scale mixed with these chords. So let's look at this lick. Sli uh, barring the first two strings here on the fifth fret, one, two, and then we're gonna go seventh fret, fifth fret on the third string, and then seven, five on the fourth string. And then we land on the seventh fret, uh, fourth string. Now the note you land on or highlight is also very important. And you're gonna wanna make sure you're landing on one of the notes in the chord, right? That's the, that's the general rule of thumb. Just any of these notes. And there's only three in a minor chord. It's the one, the flat three in the five of the major scale. So any of these notes uh, are gonna work. If you land on the root note or the A note, which is in these two spots, it's gonna sound probably the best. The next best would be playing the third or that flat third rather, which would be this. You can land on that, which we're gonna do. But that's the opening leg. And then I went and played the A minor chord right there. And I played it using that E minor shape. What's nice about this is there's really no open string. So you could play this in any key, right? In fact, once you learn this, I would encourage you to do that, to transpose it. All right. And then the next leg goes. All right, another little simple phrase, just a, a simple little statement. So again, minor pentatonic scale, pattern one, starting on the fifth fret, second string, and then we go seventh fret, third string, full bend, and then I hit the fifth fret, first string, and I use my ring finger for that. So I've got the bar there on the first two strings in the fifth fret, and I went. Now you could pick that first string if you want, but I find it easier to pick on the third string and pluck the first string. And then watch this. So that's a bend and release on the seventh fret, third string, and then a pull off so that I can play that uh, fifth fret third string. Remember I said you can land on the notes in the chord. That would be landing on the flat third. But but this is like an Albert King technique where when you're playing that note and you hit the vibrato, you can push that a little sharp because you're going into the major. You're not going all the way, but just, it just gives it enough of a, an uneasy feeling. It really works in a minor chord. So that leg goes. And then I went and came down and hit the A minor down here. You could play it up here too if you want. All right, so this next phrase sounds like this. All right, let's learn this. Now, where this is coming from would be an A minor, add nine. 
So this is uh, another thing I should mention. When, when I talked about connecting the, the chord shapes, the A minor chord shapes to the pentatonic scale, that's true, but you can also connect any other version of a minor chord. So you could do an A minor nine, an A minor seven, an A minor six. You know, there's all these different variations. Um, and so what I'm doing here is an, it's called an A minor add nine. I just love that sound. In fact, I ended this song with that sound. It's kind of an uneasy thing. But this note would be the nine. That'd be like the, if we're going through the, the minor scale, we would go up to the ninth interval. It would be that note. And so when I played and, and landed on that note and sort of focused on that note, that's why. It's because I was connecting it in my mind to this minor nine sound uh, chord. Okay, so it's fifth fret, second string, eighth fret, second string, fifth fret, first string, and then we go to the minor nine there, which is the, uh, the add nine rather, seventh fret, uh, first string, so this is how I do it, as I play it, and I slide up a fret to the eighth fret, and then back to the seventh fret, and then do a pull off to the fifth fret. So all of that was picked once. Now I see other players do this kind of thing like this. So they're doing like a pull on, or a hammer on, pull off, pull off. It just depends on what's easiest for you. If that's too difficult, just skip it, go. That would be fine too. You know, don't let one little technical thing uh, throw, you know, throw you off completely or shut you down rather. Always work towards it. I'm not saying just bypass something if it's too difficult, but, but don't let it stop you from finishing a song, right? Okay. After that, I slid up into pattern two of the minor pentatonic scale and played another A note, but we're playing it now in the 10th fret second string. And then, uh, 8th fret, 2nd string, and then watch this. This is middle finger on the 9th fret, 3rd string, index finger on the 8th fret, 2nd string. And this is Blues 101. This is the, the pattern 2 of the minor pentatonic scale, but this little harmonized 3rd here, you hear that all the time in blues. Triplets, it's used single notes like we're doing here, lots of different uses for it. But just know where that is uh, in, re in relation to your, you know, pattern one or pattern two, however you can see it. But just, you can use that and you let that be a go-to thing, at, you know, back to our phrasing th ideas. First of all, like I said, it's okay to repeat an, a, a, a phrase, but just get this into your vocabulary. So if you ever get lost when you're soloing, it's a great go-to uh, you know, to, until you can get your head, head back in gear. That's what I do. I have a lot of little spots in the neck that I can go to when I get lost, and it happens all the time. Okay. So that's how we conclude this. So we're playing just strings three and two there, using that little shape. And then sliding back into pattern one, seventh fret, third string, fifth fret, and then down to the seventh fret fourth string. And while that note rings out, which is an A, I hit the A on the fifth fret first string. That's a very common blues lick. It works for a minor song and for a major. hear that in a lot of Chicago blues, it's even in Delta blues. It sounds really good with over, really heavy overdriven guitar as well. Okay, let's take it from the beginning and play up to that point. All right, so now the song goes to the D minor, which is our minor four chord. And so what I played to get into that was... So let me, let's me let look at that. Seventh fret, fourth string, strings two and three on the fifth fret. And then we're sliding back into that same lick that we were just playing. Now I'm using my middle finger and ring finger to do that. That's that pattern two, bottom part of pattern two, right? Same thing. So... 
but then I'm gonna slide that down two frets. Now some of you are going, wait, why this note? That's not in, in your minor pentatonic scale pattern one. And you're right, it's not, but it's in the D minor chord. So look, we're playing the D minor chord like this using the A minor shape. You're seeing, if I play just str strings three and two, these two notes. Ah, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm highlighting the notes in the chord, right? And then I slide it up and then back into the chord. This is a minor uh, little a minor chord trick you can remember going forward. Anytime you're playing a minor chord, it doesn't matter if it's over the one chord or the four chord, um, you can always slide up two frets this direction towards the body of the guitar and then back down with that minor chord using any of those voicings I just showed you. Okay, so what I mean, like if I was playing an A minor here, right? And then you go to the four chord. Right, it's a great little vamp. And then to get us back into the A minor from that D minor, I went. Right, little kind of uh, aggressive lick. It kind of fits into the phrasing thing where it goes back into the emotional part of it. I'm just, you know, I'm not doing anything technical. But I wanted to throw that in just to give you ideas. So I'm just doing a bend. You know, it's nothing elaborate with my left hand. My right hand is just doing down strokes, picking string three there. So seventh fret, third string. And where I'm at mentally, in terms of scale, as I'm back in minor pentatonic scale pattern one. Right, even though the song was still transitioning to that one chord, you can go ahead and play ahead of the chord a little bit. This happens all the time in, in when you're playing lead. So after I played the, the bend, release, 5th fret 3rd string, 7th fret 4th string, 7th fret 3rd string, so you can see my ring finger covered both of those strings, back to the 5th fret 3rd string, and then you land on the 7th fret 4th string. So actually it was a half bend when I did it, it wasn't a full bend. Sounds a little more uh, more bluesy or aggressive when you just do a half bend. Just practice that. I remember having a hard time doing that when I learned to do that. But you can do it in 15 minutes if you just keep pra practicing this kind of thing until you get comfortable with it. And then play your little A minor thing there. Let's back it up from the beginning and play up to that point. And then the next lick was. Albert King kind of lick. We're back in minor pentatonic scale pattern one. Just barring strings one and two on the fifth fret. This kind of Chuck Berry, right? Um, that's a, you know, another must know area. So you got up here and then you, you got this in terms of playing two notes, two strings at once. Um, this is a, just another one you got to know. Fifth fret, first string, uh, and second string at the same time. And I went, so slid into it on the second string, one, two, and then eighth fret, first string, back to the fifth fret, first string. So, all right, now the song goes to the five chord and I went, into the E. So I'm now dropped down to the second string, still minor pentatonic scale pattern one, but I'm in, uh, um, I start on the fifth fret, second string, I come up to the eighth fret, 
full bend, release, and then it did a pull off down to the fifth fret um, second string. Now this note is a must know note. You have to think about this note. Anytime you're playing a blues and you're going to the five chord, this note, get it in your head from your minor pentatonic scale pattern one. So when you're in pattern one, this note, that's your that's the note for your five chord. Also, an octave lower down here. So you've got the two spots. So you can do whatever you want, but try and land a resolve on that note. Right, so that's why that sounds so good. Because I'm playing the E note. And then I go into the five chord, which is the E. Okay, so... Um, So once I hit that, then I hit the low E, which is the open sixth string. And then I, this is a, another blues lick that you gotta know. Most of you know this probably by now, but you play your E chord and then just take your index finger off. Play the open third string and hammer it on. It sounds so cool. And then you can do an upstroke on the open E string uh, from the one string. Pinky on the third fret second string to give you an E7. All right, so you have. How bluesy is that? It doesn't get any more bluesy than that. And then we go back to the four chord. And I just slid into pattern one for a minute. Uh, seventh fret, fourth string, fifth fret, third string, seventh fret, third string, slide up to the ninth fret, third string. And then watch this. Now I'm back into the chord shape. This is why I started off uh, this, this thing breaking down these chord shapes. This is your D minor chord, but I'm playing the triad, just the top three strings. You gotta know this. It's easy to play because it's a little stair step. Fifth fret, first string, uh, sixth fret, second string, seventh fret, third string, but know where that comes from, that triad. It's your A minor shape. You're just playing the top three strings. And like I said before, you can take your minor chord and go up two frets this direction. So that's what I was doing. Just rocking back and forth, going up two frets. And then watch this. I came all the way up here, 12th fret first string, 13th fret second string, 14th fret third string. What is that? Pause the video if you don't know, and just pause it right now and work that out. Figure out what's going on there. Well, I went back to the A minor chord, right? We went back to the one chord. So that's your A minor, just the top three strings of it. And there's this is used in some, like, uh, what is the John Mayle song? You know, that has that lick in it, right? But now you know where that lick comes from. It's just the minor chord. You're just picking the notes out of it, out of that triad. But how cool does that sound? Robert Cray uses that. And I'm just, you know, playing the chord, but giving that vibrato. So I played the A minor and then I went. Came back down into the kind of the muddy waters lick down. Um, so that's seventh fret, third string. This is just minor pentatonic scale pattern one. Bend and release, pull off, and then seventh fret, uh, fourth string. And then I hit the open one string, and then watch this. That's how I ended it. How cool is that, that ending there? Just because of that chord, the chord is what makes it. That's the A minor add nine that we talked about when I played. That note right there. So it's just an A minor chord, but I've got my pinky on the uh, seventh fret first string. And then I slid that down one fret and slid into it. And that's really the whole composition. And now you have something you can sit down and practice with. You don't have to get on a jam track. Um, and so that's why I put this together, is to give you a, something that you can just think about the phrasing, think about the fact that you're playing a, then you're stopping, right? None of it is very technical. It's very straightforward from, from a technical standpoint, but hopefully you understand these chord shapes. You can see them now. You can see the pentatonic scales are connected to them. It gives you options for playing and, and improvising.
All right, I hope you've enjoyed that. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, you can just hit the subscribe button and then click that alert bell, and then you can be notified when I put out new lessons like this, which I do every week. All right, we'll see you next week for something new.